wherever you are in the United States, you are probably on Indian land. Lands that were acquisitioned and controlled by people that weren't from this place. Good evening and welcome to Radio Free Alcatraz. This is John Fidel welcoming you on behalf of the Indians of all tribes to Indian Land Alcatraz Island. My name is Johnny Barakup Stiffarm. I am a member of the Cinnaboyne and Sioux Nation. Located in northeastern Montana, I live about seven miles west of Wolf Point, Montana, down by the Missouri River. In 1969, my mother was ill, and so I had to work two jobs that summer. I worked as a short order cook and dishwasher at a local restaurant on a reservation, and I also worked as a candy striper at the hospital. When the fall came, a lot of my cousins that had already left and they've gone you know, to trade school and to college and technical school and that, and uh, there's only a handful of us left there on the reservation. So I took some of my savings and I bought myself a one-way plane ticket to Los Angeles. I went to go visit my cousin, Julie Lilly. She was down there going to school to learn how to be a secretary on relocation. We were at a party one weekend and there was all these UCLA students there. And there was this young woman who was running around getting upset with everyone because they were not getting in the van in order to leave to go to San Francisco. And finally, she yelled at everyone, I will be willing to take anybody who wants to go to San Francisco. Anybody who wants to go up there to help support the Indians who have taken over Alcatraz Island. I didn't know what Alcatraz was, but I knew I'd never been to San Francisco. And I was 18, fresh out of high school, fresh off the res, and adventurous. They said that they would take me back to the apartment so I could get a change of clothes. And I figured a day trip up there and a day trip back. So I told my cousin, I'm going with her. We came up here, three van loads of young people, and we all went out to the island, and when it came time and they all left, I didn't leave, I stayed. I think that many of the veterans who came from Alcatraz have never bragged about their stories, have never talked about it. Not because they weren't proud of it, but because they were humble people. I was hoping and always praying that when I looked at an Alcatraz documentary, I would see old friends and people who were really there that were down in the trenches. Good to be back again. I've been back a couple times before. I brought my mother, who was one of the original people that occupied Alcatraz back in 1969. A few years ago, she mentioned this and wanted to be here, so. I took it upon myself to save some money and do what we said we were going to do to come here. And now we're here. Well, these American Indians, these tribal people who were students, who were veterans coming back from Vietnam, who were young American Indians like myself, who just happened to show up and came out to the island and stayed there and were part of the occupiers that helped to take that stand. And there were many, many American Indian activism events prior to Alcatraz. But the difference between them and Alcatraz is that Alcatraz captured worldwide attention. You gotta remember, at that time, we did not have cell phones. We did not have social media. We did not have instant access to getting the word out to the world. Seven years, seven tears, seven years.
I have a very dear friend by the name of David Leach. David Leach was the first person to put his foot on and step on an island on the takeover where the 14 landed. He was one of the 14, and he's a Colville Lakota. I just planned on just tagging along with Johnny and it was just playing it by ear. <laughs> Is there anybody you're excited to see? I don't know, I'd have to see him first. <laughs> and where were the underground caves? Remember that underground place? Oh, well, that dungeon? Yeah, the dungeon. It was the jail during the Civil War. That's just that one thing we moved. Okay. Who are you? Jonathan. Johnny Verso. What's your name? David Leach. David Leach. Hey, boy. No, oh. I was uh, recon, oh. Marine Corps recon, oh. but we parachuted. Yeah, I see you got <laughs> 100% first Yeah, 100 first. Did you live on the island? I did. You did? Yeah. You remember us? I was there for oh. about 10 I, I months. Was one, I was one of the original 14 that took over. There was shit. Yeah, yeah. I didn't wow. even live there long. What's your first name? David. David. David Lynch. Right. I came over three days later, and then uh, Richard put me in charge of the security. I, just I used got to work down. security. Yeah. 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 There's Geneva. Several of us have been back to the island since the occupation. I have been back a few times. This time, I brought my family. I uh, have three family members who were able to come on, on this trip with me because I didn't know if they really knew why I was doing what I was doing. And so by having them come with me to Alcatraz, I hope that it would give them some insight into why their mother became the way she is and why I take the positions I take. <laughs> On the way to Alcatraz again. Yeah. <laughs> 50 <laughs> years later. So my oldest and firstborn child is my daughter, Jolene. I much like the history. She's talked about it ever since I was little. So she can show me what she did and what they did and where she stayed and she wanted to show us. So we'd have a history and then we can show our children that, you know, this is where your grandma was, this is what they did. And so I think I'm here to complete a part of my circle. It's a part of who I am. It's a part of my identity. I think it's a time of healing. It's a time of letting go of a lot of old ghosts. The Indians welcome message will be repeated by former occupiers and their families. Again, this is another event that's only taking place today. Today is the 50th anniversary of the takeover by Native Americans. Okay. Is that around? Oh man. And it's a part of me being able to say, this is who I am to my children. And this is who I am to all my brothers and sisters. My grandma is um Johnny Lee, Bear Cub, Stafford. I'm the oldest out of all of, them, all of the grandchildren. How many grandkids are there? Uh, I them all. Me, Shay, Cookie, Millie, Joe, Jerry, um, Ham, Marlene. Eight? I'm, I'm all for Indian rights, but I'm, I'm not a political activist like my grandmother or my dad was. Uh, However, I did go on a, a peace mission when I was 12 years old that my grandmother set me up on. They wanted, uh, they wanted some white kids, some Asian kids, you know, uh, black kids, and uh, they wanted a native kid to, basically what they were looking for was the token Indian. They wanted uh, somebody to dance, speak their language, do a craft. And then I was raised that way by my grandma and all of them. I power a lot with um, my other side of the family. Like my mom beads for a living, so we're basically the artists of the family. Most people who come here want to see the prison, want to learn more about the history.
history of the prison, more about the stories. But this week in particular has been wonderful because we get to highlight another aspect of this island, which is talking about the anniversary of the Alcatraz occupation. On behalf of the National Park Service, welcome to Alcatraz and welcome to the opening of our new exhibit, Red Power on Alcatraz Perspective. <laughs> I was interviewed by John Trudell for Radio Free Alcatraz. Good evening and welcome to Radio Free Alcatraz. When did you come out to Alcatraz? About three weeks ago. And how long do you plan on staying? I plan on staying until we do get the island or until at least we get some word from the government. The first thing I remember is when we got to the pier and there was a whole series of different boats that were pulling in and people were getting into the boats and these owners of the boat were taking people out to the island. And so we got to this one speed boat and we came out to the island. There was about five of us in the boat with the, the driver of the boat. And we pulled up and there was this, this uh, I don't even know if that was the water barge or if that was just a part of the dock that we came yeah, to. The water, the water barge was right here. We pulled in like this. And I think the thing that impressed me the most about the island is sure the prison was there, but it was so beautiful. And the sights and the scene and the smell of the ocean and the numbers of people that were there, all the way from babies to the older adults and that. I remember that. I just remember lots and lots of Indians. I was seven years old, my brother was nine, when our mother brought us to Alcatraz. We grew up in Los Angeles, and so we went to school with every nationality. We didn't really know that we were Indian because in LA there was no real Indian community at that time. And so when we came here, there was a, a really great sense of community. You know, I was so impressed that there's so many different types of Indians. It was the first time I ever saw a White Mountain Apache woman dancing in her her regalia dress, which is very different from ours, similar but different. And I was just amazed at how many different tribes there were in the United States, let alone seeing an Aztec. You know, we thought they were all dead. Aztecs, yeah, <laughs> dead. They were just in the movies and the books. Like that we're flying around at the time. We didn't know it was exciting, scary, you know, fear of the unknown. We didn't know what's gonna happen. I met some people, I found out what they were doing and why they were doing that, that they were taking a stand and they were invoking the treaty right that we had that any federal lands that were no longer being used by the feds for the purposes that they took them for would revert back to the tribes. And so since this was no longer a federal prison and they weren't doing anything with it, well then we were claiming it on behalf of all the tribes. All of the things that my grandparents had taught me about treaties and had talked to me about the different things that we needed to stand up for and we needed to be proud for and we should never give up our lands and all of this, all of a sudden it made sense. My name is Janice Ochoa and I came to Dallas when I was 15 years old. My mother comes away from Alcatraz and I came to Dallas when I was 15 years old. And she marched me down to uh, the Indian Center and walked me into Johnny Bear Cove and said, this is my daughter. When we're on Alcatraz, we have what we call, in my culture, we call our Hunka family. You have your family that's born to you by blood. And you're related to them by blood and family ties. But you also have the right to choose a family. And Johnny Bear Cove looked at me and she said, you are my sister. 18. <laughs> She's the adult. <laughs> sure enough, the day after Christmas, 1969, I go down to the, the dock, and there's Jerry Hatch with his typewriter. So I was baby bear, bear cub, Janice bear cub, and he types up my little white card, my ID card, and off I go. And she took me out to the island, and I climbed up the stairs. I was scared spitless. And we met this beautiful man on the stairs. It was John Trudell. And we slept in his kitchen sleeping bags for a while. Well, this is the end of the day.
this was like my first community at home here. We went to UC Berkeley and, you know, we went into classes and they said, oh, you're Indian. We didn't know there was any left. That's 1966, you know, 370. <laughs> down there and thought, okay, we're going to climb it. So we were climbing this fence and then Joe Bill, Joe Bill was down there and he said, the tide is out. You just have to go around down here. You don't have to climb any fence because, you know, that's the Alcatraz story. And Joe Bill always had more common sense than any of us. My name is Dennis Turner. different takeovers and this was the fourth takeover. Many of us came from many different tribes. It's probably the best experience of my life. We came from South Toledo, this way. We snuck across. I left here in July of 1970 and I went back home. I came to Alcatraz. We were students at Fresno State College. And what was my sister Barbara here? She she stayed for two weeks on the island, got sick, had to go back, took her medication, went back to school, and I stayed. I didn't go back. My two aunts and myself we stayed. I stayed until the very last boat. I, I stayed the whole time on the island. Actually, there was two other landings years before that. There was three of them on that first landing, then about eight months after that, they came back for a second landing. They actually, we were the third and fourth landing, the 9th and the 19th. We was at the engine center. And everybody was talking and talking. I raised my hand and Al Miller, he was kind of charged and recognized me. Yeah. What do you want, David? So I said, well, all I've got to say is I know when we leave here, we go down to the water, land a boat, and go now tonight. Because we're going to go home and make plans and tell the wrong cousins. <laughs> Started going wild right around the island and exploring and stuff. And I got to the electrician shop, a blueprint map of all the plumbing on the wall behind glass. So I seen it, so I said to her, bam, broke the glass. And I took that blueprint map. And that was November 9th when we went out there. The morning of November 10th when they took us off. Well, 
I am, in fact, xenophobic and racist. And during the movement, we all trained ourselves to be that way. And it was just a matter of, of uh, realizing how we've been treated, uh, practically from day one. Uh, since I became an Indian, uh, I've been treated badly by the white man ever since. My mother and father were divorced uh, before I turned four. I already had two older brothers and a younger sister, and, and uh, then my mother got TV. So the territory of Alaska became my ward. I lived through an institutionalized uh, life as a uh, practically an orphan foster child all the way until I was 18. And then uh, four years in the Air Force. So when I was 22, when I got out of the Air Force, by then I was totally brainwashed. I think as uh, uh, many of you know, uh, beginning in the 1950s, the policy of the federal government was uh, to terminate our tribes and uh, force assimilation of our people. The Methodist Church had this large home in Seward, so that's where the state sent my sister and I. My brothers were sent to Sitka, an, an institute there. Meanwhile, my sister spent 16 years at that home, longer, longest of anybody, and as a result of that, uh, 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 some years later, after she had three children uh, and divorced her husband, uh, uh, committed suicide. Uh, both my parents and both my uh, brothers died of uh, the results of alcoholism. That's in my book. It describes how I overcame all of that and, and began learning. The President of the United States in 1970 declared that this policy of assimilation and termination of Indian tribes was over, and the new policy was Indian self-determination and the recognition of Indian treaties and the right of Indian people to continue to exist. But it all started right here in Alcatraz in 1969. I think the lessons like greed and racism are not taught in the schools, they're not taught in church, they're not taught on the street corner, they're taught at the dinner table. And so my opinion is that greed is a learned behavior. It's not standard equipment to us because you don't see it in any other animal species. You don't see lions collecting piles of gazelles. So I think it can be unlearned, but I think it has to be done at the dinner table, individually. And that, to me, is a, a monumental task. In practically every one of our villages in Alaska, and there's hundreds of them, are now modern with, with cell phones and TV and, and internet and, and uh, electricity and and uh, but there are still some of the villages that don't have running water and sewage yet um, but uh, every one of those villages have been forced into a cash economy people must find gainful employment and, and find a way to to make a living and earn money and such uh, the problem with that is that the, the uh, large share of that kind of daily living and thinking is directly opposes traditional thinking. There are people out there that can figure this out and people really need to start getting motivated to figure it out because we're not allowed to go out on the street corner and shoot ourselves, commit suicide. Somebody will stop us. But as a, as a race of human beings, we're collectively committing suicide and nobody seems to be doing anything about it. And it's insane, in my opinion. 
I've always had my hair long, and, and uh, uh, in fact, or when I I forced Arco to hire me through a uh, discrimination suit against them, which I won. Uh, but in order to get a job at a refinery up there, I had to cut my long hair off. Um, and I haven't cut it since. Um, back here. That's the way it is around the country. And so uh, we, we remain xenophobic. Proudly. I came to Alcatraz in November in 1969. I came with my sister and I was here until May of 1970. And we just lived here. There was another struggle going on and they called for people to come up to that Lake Pyramid. And so she went and I stayed here with her children. They were like four and five years old. We were just here. We thought she'd come back, but she never did. I was 15 years old and had two children. <laughs> Alcatraz was taken over and put together by students and other American Indians from the reservations and from the urban communities. It was done so by a group called Indians of All Tribes. And Indians of All Tribes here at Alcatraz had another component of us who were up in the Northwest in the Seattle area. Yeah, after I left Alcatraz, I ended up at the uh, Pallet Fishing Lights fight up there in Tacoma. We were engaged in Washington State in the Indian Fish Wars, and the state was stopping our fishermen from, or fisher people from fishing. And so um, the, uh, the state was down on us, and then the fish buyers whacked the prices way back, so it wasn't uh, feasible or profitable for our fishermen to fish. Inspired by the occupation here and the assertion of uh, Indian rights, we started undertaking the most important cases for Indians across the country, and one of those was the big treaty fishing rights case up in the Northwest. Those tribes in the Northwest around the Puget Sound area had 1855 treaties that guaranteed them the right to take fish at their usual and accustomed places. They were uh, basically denied that right. By law, the Indians get half the salmon in the state of Washington, period. Just by law. And uh, that's what they've been fighting for all these years. Because the cops came to confiscate the fish nets and stuff at the camp. We prevailed in the end. We we got uh, U.S. versus Washington, the Bolt decision. So we did in the end uh, succeed. But at that time, the game wardens were knocking the bottoms out of our boats and uh, taking our uh, outboard motors and dropping them in salt water and slashing nets and arresting fishermen. So it was. Uh, it was a hard time for us and linking up with other activist Indians uh, gave us some support. I used Alcatraz as a base of operations. I'd already been involved in the Fort Lawton invasions in Seattle. We started the Puyallup Armed Fish Camp on the Puyallup River. So the people down here that supported us. L.D. Brad, her children were Peter, Ben, and Georgia. My son was 10 at the time, Eric Bennett. And they helped my son sell salmon at the Berkeley um, food co-ops uh, in Chinatown and uh, at the Alcatraz Receiving Depot. And so uh, L.D. and I were friends. And she came up to our Puyallup uh, fishing camp, which, which was an armed fishing camp. The reason we armed ourselves is because the local uh, uh, 
antagonists that oppose us were uh, all white and they, uh, they begin pot shotting at us, trying to scare us. I ended up facing a double life sentence there. Yeah? I shoot it out with two federal fish and game agencies with the charge. They were the only two feds there, all the rest was state and county and vigilantes and stuff. So we armed ourselves and returned fire on them and, and, uh, and at the same time, we had to escort the Puyallup fishermen up and down the river along the bank while they fished. I was in the camp one day and this car come rolling in with a bunch of women and uh, they started unloading supplies for us. And one of the supplies that they unloaded was a box of Tampax. And I said, Tampax, I need Kotex for pressure packs for bullets. And they laughed. They said, we didn't know you asked for anything. These are the fuses for your Molotov cocktails. And so we used them for fuses for Molotov cocktails. And there was a case of Molotov cocktails sitting in our fishing camp. And when 550 pigs came in in riot gear, Eldy, who was from here, but up there with us, was scared. You know, it's scary to have 550 guns pointed at you. So she sat down on this box, and it was Molotov cocktails. So when she got arrested, they charged her with explosives. She got a big charge. She was looking at 25 years in prison. And all she did was get scared and sat down. So, you know, there was a connection between our Puyallup struggle and the people here at Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. What needs to be happening is when they start throwing punches, you throw punches back. If they start shooting, you start shooting back. Because I'm not a barter. I'm a dog soldier, mentally. I said, I'm just not going to take any shit. <laughs> With that treaty, uh, we took to court, had it uh, interpreted by the judge. We had testimony from the tribal leaders, and they said what that language means is we are sharing this fishery that sustained us since the beginning of time. We're sharing it with the non-Indians coming in, and we can continue to fish at our usual and accustomed places, even though they're not on the reservations anymore. Well, the court went with the Indians and upheld the treaty rights and went all the way to the Supreme Court eventually, and the tribes won out, and so they got the right to half the fish with no state fishing license, all under tribal regulation. That's the power of a treaty. After I left Tacoma, after uh, making it to court, the judge didn't show up. Our lawyer didn't show up, the prosecutor didn't show up, and the judge didn't show up. I made it. They didn't. Their failure to appear. So I just caught a train that night out of Tacoma. And I sat there and said, now where the hell can a fugitive hide? I said, oh, I'll just go to college. You know, and anybody else that hasn't had a chance to introduce themselves, would you please come up and maybe share a little of your experiences? Now I want to know exactly what it is that they did. I've always seen the signs. I've always seen the pictures. And... Last night, you know, I, I heard some of the stories. And at 73, I only had two semesters left that I was going to graduate. They caught up with me and kept me in Spokane County Jail for nine days. And then none of those cops wanted anything to do with me because they were you know, pissed off. They were dropping all charges over the house, you know. You know, I grew up hearing these stories my whole life. It's almost like I know them without even being here. So that's why I said, you know, it's finally nice to be able to put names to faces and faces to names. After Alcatraz, 
I ended up at Wounded Knee as a guerrilla soldier uh, uh, with the Alcatraz squad. Al Miller uh, is one of our, our leaders here on the island, uh, uh, was our squad leader. The Alcatraz crew at Wounded Knee uh, 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 we did our duty with honor on Wounded Knee. The reason we left Wounded Knee was because um, uh, food was scarce and the camp was becoming overpopulated. I had 13 rifles and about, about 1,500 rounds of ammunition. And I had a, three meals a day for 10 people for one month. Freeze dried food. I went down to the police station. Yeah, what's going on? Where do you get all these guns going and everything else? I said, well, I said, I have family from here. When I was here, I said, I plan on doing a little bit of deer hunting. So that's why I brought the guns. And I said, the food, you're going to camp out. So that's why I brought the food. I said, the medical supplies and bandages were for wounded me. Because that was my mom's insistence. Came back and said, you're not getting the food and you're not getting the bandages. But they gave me the rifles and ammunition. <laughs> right here is where we pull guard duty, 24 hours a day, right here. It's like a whole little town, it's a whole little city, and then I didn't know it was so far away, you know, so isolated and stuff. And just the grandeur of the buildings, and it's just amazing. Korea's Clearwater had, had uh, donated $10,000 to us and wanted to remain anonymous. And uh, so we made an offer to one of the regular uh, charter boats that we used. And the owner took the offer, and also we were pretty good friends with him. He trained uh, a few of us to run the boat. Once we got the boat, we named it the Clearwater. And uh, uh, used that until uh, we were taken off the island. Whether you were a cook, a mechanic, an electrician, teacher, medical staff, media relations, regardless of our specific responsibilities, everyone who lived on that island for a long period of time contributed. I was one of the boat operators and made regular runs back and forth uh, uh, twice a day, sometimes once a day. Everybody had jobs, and so I worked in the kitchen. They had the little classes for the children, so I would take them up, you know, and then I'd go work in the kitchen all day. Then I'd go get them, and we'd go to our little apartment. Some of us spoke at civic functions and learned to be very good at public speaking. We spoke about the facts, about the treaties themselves, about the things that were happening on our own reservations and the conditions there. What's it like on the reservation? Well, at home on the reservation, everyone's getting these houses, houses that the federal government built. It's something to laugh at. To give you a new house, no way to keep it up, no means. Is that, uh, how, how are the people accepting these houses, though? What's the general reaction? Well, they like the house and stuff. And like I said, at that time, nobody was famous. They were going to become a cultural center. Their main focus was on education. You know, they planned a university. And so there was me and another guy, and we were both 15 years old. And I think that was that elf and Willie, and we just called him Willie. And they picked the two of us to be the first graduates of Alcatraz. And so they didn't have a teacher to teach us, so they sent us to a private school in San Francisco. So we went back and forth every day to that private school, and it was a real uppity school. It was where, like, the mayor's children went to school, and uh, movie star children went to school. I never got taught anything. I just um, had to make a report of what was going on at Alcatraz, what we were doing, and what our purpose was and stuff like that. So 
every class I went to, that's what I did, was just end up making a report to everybody. And then since I was going back and forth every day, they wanted me to take the mail across and bring the mail back and stuff like that. So I did that for a while. As far as running the boat though, back and forth, uh, hauling supplies and such, it didn't matter what the weather was like. One day there were, there were huge rollers coming in from the Pacific. Huge swells, as high as four foot chalk. It was like in January of 1970, and uh, the water was real bad going back and forth, and sometimes I couldn't get across where the water was too choppy. I got across and I couldn't come back. And so they would find us a place to stay. The main office of Alcatraz, or else they would send us to somebody's home. Sometimes they were really fancy houses. And, oh, like there was the first time I ever ate leg of lamb and stuff like that, you know. Some of us were, were desert Indians and had never been on the water much, and so they were uh, terrified at times, hanging on for dear life, you know, as we come across. My relation. My relation. Let go of your fears, for now is the time to take courage. My relation, look, for this is a beautiful life. Beauty is everywhere. You are here today, my relation, and nothing is more beautiful than that. It is our responsibility to acknowledge the land that we are on. No matter where we go, we are on stolen native land. Right now we are in the shared waters of the Miwok, the Chechenyo, the Ramatush. So very important that we acknowledge that. And so I want to offer a song. So this is Canyon's Chumash Grandmother song. Boy, boy, oh, come on! But it was good. It was really good because I was like everybody's little sister. Everybody, you know, took care of us, made sure that we had everything that we needed and stuff like that. This is a book that was done by Troy R. Johnson, and this picture here shows me right here without the bike, and my brother is in the background there. I will tell you something about this picture, though. It's a funny story. If, if you look close, you can see that my hand, my right hand, is up my sleeve. When I found that photograph and I showed it to my brother, he asked me, he said, do you know why your right hand was up your sleeve? And I said, no, I have no idea. And he said, well, that year at Christmas, there was hardly anything to go around. So somebody had donated a Hot Wheels set with tracks in one car. Somebody split up that set and gave the tracks to one kid and the car to somebody else. Well, I'm the one that got the car. And my brother said, you kept that car in your hand with your hand up your sleeve. Now, the kids that had the tracks, they wanted that car. And I, I don't blame them. They eventually cornered us by the end of the Ira Hayes building and took it from me. And so when my brother told me that, the first thing that came to my mind was, wow, I got, I got carjacked on Alcatraz. When you talk about historical fact, you really need to recognize that Alcatraz was something that happened over a period of time. There were several takeovers that had occurred, but in almost all of these takeovers, there were students involved. When the Indian Center in San Francisco burnt down, and then a bunch of students from UC Berkeley and, and San Francisco State were talking about how there's no place for us to get together, and Richard Oakes knew about that Sioux Treaty and surplus Indian lands. If they abandon something, we'll claim it back. So we thought, that's a good idea. 
Treaties are the supreme law of the land. The treaties with the tribes, the states have no jurisdiction over. So that's what the Constitution says. In the Fort Laramie Treaty, there's a clause in there that says any federal lands that are no longer being used for the purpose that the government had taken it, that the federal government had to give it back to the tribes. It did not specify what tribe. It didn't specify where any of those federal lands had to be. It didn't specify if they were being decommissioned as a military base, if they were being uh, retired as a federal prison, if they were being retired as office buildings or whatever. But if that land was federal land, and they were no longer using it, they needed to give it back to the tribes. The uh, occupation of Alcatraz in 1969 really started the modern day Indian movement. It occurred at a time in this country when there was a civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement was all about the uh, rights of minorities that were being ignored and when they asked uh, our people about their civil rights and whether they wanted equal rights our people were saying no we want our treaty rights and that fight for the treaty rights started right here in Alcatraz in 1969 what I'm more proud of than anything is in this last 50 years to see American Indian communities thrive. Recovery programs, economic development, Indian clinics and hospitals, you know. I'm so proud of the families that we met here. I came on the third wave on the 20th, and then uh, I was in here continuous. I was taking a leadership training program at UC Berkeley. And I had to attend classes eight hours a day and lose my scholarship. Lenada was really our leader from UC Berkeley that was speaking up on the council all the time, and then Richard Oakes and Al Miller from San Francisco State. I came because of Richard Oakes, and after uh, he left, there was nothing left for me here. You know, he was my inspiration. help in native resistance, especially women. You know, you never they never get any credit, you know. The only people who got credit in those days were the biggest and the loudest, I think. Women have been the backbone of all of us. And women like my mother and others who took leadership and said we can't do this. We can't let them terminate us. We are people, we are humans, we are here. The women were the ones who set the policy. The women were the ones who helped to put together and establish the bylaws and the Constitution. And there were some very strong women there with very strong personalities. Lenada Means, who is now known as Dr. Lenada Warjack. Lenada and a couple of lawyers, they did, uh, I was the gopher, basically. Did all the paperwork. You'll have my name on articles of corporation, constitution and bylaws and stuff. And then they went up to Sacramento and walked it through. Stella Leach was a nurse, but she had been very active in establishing free clinics and she had all her boys, so they were also very active. There were just a lot of women who had brilliant ideas. Well, I went, yes. <laughs> and we were all cute. On the island, we were out there away from everything. Hauling 50 gallons of water a day uh, meant hauling it up from the dock to where we were living here, to, to the kitchen especially. Container on each hand and up those steep stairs from the dock, walking it up. It was when it was in San Francisco, and they did want to use Now the Buffalo's Gone to close the radio show, uh, which of course, they, that was easy. That was how, uh, that was an honor. They did that. But I asked John, what is it that you need? They needed water, so I was providing water. The 
man that we bought the boat from had a lease at the Fisherman's Wharf at one of the uh, spots there. And so we just took over that lease. That's where we uh, docked the boat every day at Fisherman's Wharf. It eventually sunk here in the slip. And the part of it was because uh, one of the operators had probably hit rocks here when they were, when they were stowing it in the slip and, and uh, caused it a leak. Because of the generosity of the Bay Area and others for that particular time on Alcatraz, we were freed from the constraints of worrying about things like money. The whole city here backed us 100%. Mm -hmm. We just caught a lift ride this morning, for example, and one of the old driver, there was an older driver, and he remembers us from that day. <laughs> and um, he agreed that the, the whole city were, were behind us 100%, along with with Oakland and Berkeley and and, uh, and such. So we were well taken care of. <laughs> 50 years later. Yeah, but I wasn't here that long. Some of them were, you know, I was here six days. It was actually Indian Liberation Day, May 31st, 1970. So that's the night I left. The next day, the, uh, the, the uh, water tower burnt down and some other buildings. So they never knew who did that. I think they're still trying to find it. The last picture over here was the proclamation. Right. It was on deerskin. And where that presentation took place was right there. There were some apartment buildings right here, right over there, but they're since gone. There were apartments here, and we were living in the apartments on the island. And they tried to say that we tore those down and we destroyed federal government property, and no way we could have done that. Those things were made to last. <laughs> so we, yeah, prison, yeah, you're right. But yeah, we had so much support from all over the world. And I mean, this place was crawling news media. There would be some days here on the island to where we'd see a lot of people and uh, find places for them to just crash, spend the night. I was here in, when I was 15 years old in March 1970. And I came with a group of Japanese Americans, and they came with a big banner that said, Japanese Americans support Native Americans. And we brought food and water and vegetables and clothing. And I have the actual newspaper, which says, Asians make waves at Alcatraz. There's a picture of Stella Leach. And she's telling us about how there are classes that teach the Sioux language and native arts. And they welcomed us. It was so cold and freezing that day. But it was such a warm feeling. And I'll, I'll never forget that. Thank you so much. And Saturday, we were uh, kind of stranded on the island because of bad weather. Sunday, not many boats running. That winter in San Francisco Bay was particularly harsh and that I've actually found new newspaper articles and I think it was dated January 71 and it talked about how it was an unusually cold winter in the bay and so I was sick in the Ira Hayes house the apartment building on the that end of the parade ground and was probably in, in bed for a week or maybe a little more during that time there was a man that was there all the time and he was either praying or chanting or singing and every time I woke up, he was there. I don't remember seeing my brother or my mother all the time, but this man was there all the time. And so I really wish I could find out who he was, because if he's still alive, I would love to thank him. How did he climb up there? There's a, there's a stairwell. There's a, the there's a door on the other side, then there's a ladder. I mean, a stairwell that goes so far all the way up. You didn't go up there? Not me. <laughs> My name is Herb Butler. I'm at the Baskin from uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, a uh, member of the Nidana tribe. I was here in June, in fact, the morning after the warden's house burned up. And because of the wind, especially, the 
lighthouse was seriously smoke damaged. Smoke just spiraled right up the, the lighthouse here and, and, uh, and covered the light assembly and, and uh, reflection systems and, and glass completely. Tonight, we, there's a little background noise here. We had a problem and we're running our generator inside the studio. We've been having quite a bit of hassle lately with our electricity. We had a power failure on Friday. We didn't have any lights at all uh, or any power of any type to use. We know why they shut electricity off especially and that was to shut the lighthouse off and then use that as an excuse to come to the island and take us off. I'm an electrician and, and uh, advanced electronic tech. So got a crew here and went to work cleaning the top of the lighthouse up. Got it completely done that afternoon and then I wired it up. And that evening, as it started getting dark again, after we finished dinner, fired the generator up and turned it on, and the lighthouse worked. So the government no longer had an excuse to come get us off, and, and uh, so we continued negotiations. It was a beautiful place. I grew up in Boston, so this was the first time I've ever uh, made it. So I've never heard of reservations or something like that. So I got to meet a lot of beautiful people. I didn't know that we were going to paint. I mean, she said painting, but I didn't think we were going to paint like that far up. And what we're trying to accomplish... And to paint the Indian over the state uh, part. Uh, so the United yeah. States. So yeah, so it was pretty cool. I got my degree in higher education. I graduated from Florida State University. I got a degree in social work, social media. I didn't even know what our people were fighting for until, you know, the, the, after high school. And then when you finally realize after becoming an adult, what do you do? So this really changed a lot of the Native American youth and people at the time. Living here gave me the strength to go back and, and make sure I had the deep connections that my my ancestors always wanted for me. They prayed for me all the way from Georgia and Alabama and Oklahoma that we won't forget who we are and we won't forget how to connect, whatever. We don't have material things, but we're rich in spirit. So when I got back to Alaska in 1974, I finished uh, what I call a 17-year exile. Had to relearn everything from scratch everything. I had learned so much down here in, in the movement and such that, that I came back to Alaska with plenty of questions. I come from a large tribe. Didn't know a single person in the state of Alaska except for my sister. First of all, spending a lot of time with my elders, my, my aunts and uncles, that I immediately met and then immediately stepped into a training program or learning mode. I just overhauled a, a liquid-cooled, high-powered uh, computer at home you know, with the, the, the summer, and I'm 76. Volunteered uh, more than once into city government up there and uh, I stay abreast of all everything that happens in the state along with what happens in our nation concerning Native American people. And I've been studying now for 52 years. A lot of times when you're very young and your grandparents that tell you things and your family elders tell you things, you say, oh yeah, yeah, you know, here we go again, you know, they're saying this again. But when you have a catalyst like Alcatraz happen and it pulls all of that together and it solidifies that foundation that was laid for you, then I think it gives you strength to take all that rage and anger and fuse it as fuel. I was born in San Francisco on the Smoky Creek. Living here was my first 
opportunity to be in an all Indian community in the city. We fought for ethnic studies. We fought for Native American studies. We were out striking, and that's what I did with my first college degree. Yes, we had several of our veterans have died from alcoholism and drugs, um, but many of them have gone on and done many wonderful things with their lives. They've started radio stations on their reservations. They've started newspapers. You know, they've been very active. They've become journalists. They've become photographers. They've done many, many things. And now I'm recognized as an elder at, at home. And I offer a, not a different, but a more modern way of, of, of of advice and, and uh, uh, teaching. I'm the person when things get bad and they need political action. I'm the one they call, but I'm not, I don't go in there and um, force myself upon people or anything. So I'm more or less uh, in the background giving advice. Uh, more and more of us are, are falling into that role and, and work up uh, and discuss issues, in other words, place issues into the conversation regularly. This is not the major event in our eyes, but it was an important event that helped us as young women on our, 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 our path of resistance, and it's never stopped for us. The long-range impact of Alcatraz in shaping the lives of the people where you firmly believed in something so much that you were willing to die for it. And you knew you could die at any time. Francisco on the pier, and we went over on that first boat to go to the office, John Trudell, myself, and some office people, and some other people went over to take care of laundry or do whatever it is they needed to get done. And then while we were at the office, the feds came in and took everybody off the island. We had to try to gather our stuff. They wouldn't let us back over here. So what they did was they took it to a big warehouse in San Francisco someplace. And when you walk in, it's like a building as big as this. And they had just taken the covers off of the beds and just took everything from everybody's apartment and threw it in the middle. And it was, it was stacked as high as these poles are standing in here with all of the stuff that we had. I mean, gee whiz, after 18 months, we had donations of clothes, shoes, High heels, gowns, you name it, we had it. <laughs> Fur coats, leather coats, stockings, everything was, things we could really use on the island. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody who donated. Oh, I would just like to say hello to uh, Dennis. It is so good to see so many of the people here. And the Creator sent us here for a reason. And I think it is to change the world. And we are those people. I mean, there's so much good memories here. But one of the things that's missing is the people that aren't here anymore. I'm very thankful that these ladies smudged and put us our minds in a spiritual sense. What we're going to do next is we're going to have a special song, an honoring song, specifically for one of the Alcatraz veterans, Mr. Willard Minor. But I also ask Chuck, when he sings that song, to also sing, think of all the many veterans who are no longer here with us. Many of them who wish that they could be here with us and who are making plans to come here, but who have passed away. I'm thankful for Facebook, because I, met a, I, I got a whole lot of people. My friend Gail and I... 
I thought, hey, I'm gonna look her up. And sure, I got a hold of her and she was like, oh my gee, you know. And so we were planning to meet here. And so we been planning this for about three years. My name is Gifts from His Heart, a Lakota name. I'm very honored to be here. We want to sing this honor song, memorial honor song, from Alcatraz, in honor of my older brother. So I sing this song in honor of him, and in also in honor of all those other warriors that passed on. My name is Angela Miller. I'm the daughter of Alan Miller. Um, our dad, he, he was originally from Oklahoma and he's from the Seminole and Creek tribes. Nobody really knew the story of this movement. They would sometimes kind of find it accidentally. They would see the uh, documentary that he was in. Alcatraz is not an island. And people came from California twice to interview my dad. He didn't really do it, you know, for like publicity. He just did it because at the time it was something that he felt needed to be done for Indian people. Al stood there facing an APC a few hundred yards away from us. And we were all around him and um, he raised his rifle and started singing in his language at that APC. For a long time he did that and, and then when he was done we one by one began uh, our, our, our uh, trek to get out of wounded knee. And that's where I know I get my strength from was him and my mom. I don't know if they realized during that time what they were doing 50 years later, how important this was and how important it was for people back then didn't have a sense of, you know, their identity or where they had come from. It makes you proud to be a Native American person. We're here honoring our ancestors, honoring the ones who are in these prison walls, honoring the parents who went to prison here because they didn't want their kids to be in boarding school. We're here to honor the, the warriors that took a stand, peacefully, peacefully took a stand. There was no gunfire, nothing of that kind. They have to talk about those issues they don't want to talk about. We still need to be really vigilant. You must know your enemy. You must. It's, it's a strict requirement. Everyone also know to leave here and carry forth with declaration. Your prayers, your resistance, stand, solidarity, warriorness, all that, carry it with declaration. That's our powerful weaponry. I, I'm pessimistic. Uh, in that we as indigenous people here in North America will be able to perpetuate our existence. The assimilation influence and pressure is too strong. There's way, way too much modern influence and governmental influence and, and such to do that, to be able to succeed in doing that. The one thing that we can do, though, is, is, is settle all this down into history and, and, and 
and allow people well into the future to read back and see what happened. I hope my children and, and Johnny's children would know this history, give them the courage to continue to fight for Indian rights and things for Native Americans. It's, it's a, a matter of our survival and, and, and perpetuating our existence. And it's a matter of, of keeping a level of awareness out there to where, to where young people can learn and understand and keep it, keep it with them as they grow older and contend with with modern society. Long time. Well, actually, yeah, we've been up here for ceremonies for about an hour, but you couldn't have took any pictures because we were smoking the pipe and praying. So you came at the perfect time. I know for sure that by the time I I die from old age, that there won't be a single tribe in the nation that can firmly state that they'll last forever. So that's why we fight. It is just really, really good to see all kinds of people here being part of it. It's just, you know, one of those things that I will never forget. Power to the people! Whenever you have American Indian activism, you have to take a, a look at it from that time and that generation and what tools they had to use to today's time and today's generation and the tools they use. So the Indian activism has never died out. It has always been there. It's just that it's taken a different form in a different way, depending upon the generation and the tools they have. For those of them who think nothing is happening out there, they just don't see the medium that is being used for the word to get out. What is life? What is life? What is life? What is life? Alcatraz really provided me the impetus to really strengthen my talents and I have used those throughout my life in the various positions I have held. Today I am a semi-retired corporate executive. I am home. I try to give back to the Fort Peck tribes. These are the tribes that I come from. As indigenous people, we're outnumbered by the cats and dogs in this country, you know, but still we're still here and we still resist. Why? This is where we originally came from. We don't have a gene pool in Europe or any place else. This is it. We are indigenous to this land. Times I feel and times I hide 
chance I keep the trap up inside As these days go by and by All I need is you by my side Wait for me Wait yeah. If I could see you Struggle in my mind It's changing all the time When they smile, that's a place I ain't been in a while What we see is what we know And what we know is what we'll feel and try Wait for me, wait If I could see you, the struggle in my mind is changing all the time. Oh, oh. if I could be with you, just give a little time, baby, we'll be fine.